أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء ما خاب من تمسك بكم وأمن من لجأ إليكم يا ليتنا فيا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فلما وضعتها قالت ربي إني وضعتها أنثى والله أعلم بما وضعت وليس الذكر كالأنثى صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There is no doubt that in the pre modern world, women were denied some of the most fundamental human rights. They were seen as inferior creatures. In fact, if you look at the writings of Aristotle, you'll find that Aristotle, who is regarded as the father, the intellectual father of Western civilization, he wrote that the male is by nature superior to the female. The male is superior and the female is inferior. He says that the male is the ruler and the female is the subject. If you look at the Judeo-Christian tradition, you'll find that the fall of Adam from the paradisal garden is attributed to Hawa that women are the reason why man fell from grace. And the biological realities that relate to womanhood in the form of menstruation and pregnancy, these are all divine punishments for, those, for that sin. This is the history of the pre-modern world. Women were treated as second-class citizens. What makes the religion of Islam so unique is that it was a religion that affirmed and restored the full humanity of women. Not only did it restore their full humanity, and they were seen as counterparts of men, you find that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi la basallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Oh. 
He highlighted that a man and a woman, they are equal in their nobility before their Creator. They are equal in their value before their Creator. They both have equal potential to ascend to the highest levels of paradise. There are many Quranic verses that affirm the nobility of a woman, that emphasize the dignity of a woman. And this is why some have been tempted to call the Prophet a feminist. They've attached this label to him because they say, look, this is a man who obviously advocated for women's rights. And therefore, he is a prophet and he is a feminist. Now the problem, brothers and sisters, is that it is incredibly irresponsible to attach this label to the prophet. Because the definition of feminism, and by the way, there are many strands of feminism. And as we will discover tonight, feminism is an ideologically loaded term that has a troubling history. And you definitely don't want to attach the sacred name of the prophet to something that has a problematic history. Now the Prophet Sallallahu what we can say about him without doubt is that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi wa he advocated for women's rights as defined by their creator. Feminism is something different. You know, sometimes we conflate women's rights with feminism. You can advocate for women's rights as defined by their creator, but not subscribe to feminism. In fact, there are many sisters who've told me personally that I don't, I believe in women's rights, but this ideology does not represent my values. Because ultimately, if you look at some of the standard definitions of feminism, feminism is the advocacy of women's rights based on equality of sex. And this is where the problem is. You see, brothers and sisters, in secular societies, there are certain things that we take for granted. We have these assumptions. We, we act as though that they're true. We presuppose certain principles. And one of them is that Justice equals equality. We've taken this for granted. We've assumed it to be true. And therefore, when we discuss women's rights, it's always through that lens. That justice means that it, we have to advocate for equality. Even Islamic feminism makes the same presupposition that Justice is equality, and therefore I am going to reinterpret the Qur'an. I am going to look at Islamic literature through that lens, and if it doesn't match, I'm going to reinterpret it so it conforms with secular feminism. The problem here is that you've elevated secular, liberal, feminist values above the Qur'an. And you are now using something else as the standard for truth. This lecture might bother a lot of people. And I have to admit, I feel a lot safer that I have a little bit of buffer between me and the sisters tonight. If you are hell-bent on this ideology, Believe whatever you want. All I want to do tonight is to help all of us revisit some of the things that we've taken for granted. That's it. Let's listen to each other with an open mind 
and an open heart because I think every person in this room ultimately wants to really follow the practice and the ways of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Before I offer my humble critique of secular feminism, and I'm, I'm lumping a lot of different isms together, because as I said, there's liberal feminism, there's radical feminism, there's Marxist feminism. There are so many different strands of feminism, but tonight, for the sake of brevity, for the sake of simplicity, let's just call all of these isms secular feminism. A feminism where God is not part of the equation for the sake of simplicity. But before we offer a critique and understand whether this ideology is actually in line with divine values, I have to give a very quick overview of the historical development of feminism. We have to go through the history. And when we go through the history, you will understand why we should be very cautious in labeling the Prophet ﷺ a feminist. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So far, so good. No tomatoes, alhamdulillah. Everything is in order, right? <laughs> One of the earliest writings on feminist philosophy was written by a woman named Mary, let me look up the name, Mary Wollstonecroft. She wrote a very important book, a foundational text called The Vindication of the Rights of Women. And in this book, and we have to give credit where credit is due, there is some common ground between feminism and the Islam that was taught by the Ahlul Bayt. There is some common ground. We have to be fair. Mary Wollstonecraft argued in her book, her main argument, because before first wave feminism, women did not have access to education. So one of the main arguments that she uses in this book is that a woman should have access to education. Her access to education should reflect her position in society. She argues that if you are going to, if the woman, if the mother is going to be the primary caretaker of children, then obviously you would want that caretaker to be educated. So she makes this argument for equal access to education. Now what's interesting about the, the development of feminism is that in many ways I sympathize with the struggle of early feminists because they were denied things that Islam granted women 14 centuries ago. We have to sympathize with their struggle to gain God-given rights the right to education. So it really began as a discussion about equal access to education. And now we come to first wave feminism. And before education, there was also a discussion about a woman's right to own property. Do you know, brothers and sisters, and this is something that I actually looked up to make sure that it was accurate, in the United States of America, in 1848, in the state of New York, the Married Women's Property Act was passed. In 1848, women, they gained the right to own property independent of their husbands. They couldn't even own property. And this is something that Islam granted to women long before. They were denied the ability to own everything had to be through their husbands. So this is something that is fairly recent. Fast forward to the early 1920s. One of the biggest issues was what? So you have women's education, women's right to own property. 
a woman's right to vote. Women's suffrage, the women's suffrage movement. In 1920, in the United States, women were finally granted the right to vote. Now when you look at the leaders of first wave feminism, when you look at the likes of Susan B. Anthony, when you look at the likes of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, when you look at Rebecca Felton, these other, these prominent names in first wave feminism, you have to understand that, you know, we're not talking about a bunch of sweet old ladies that would come together and sip some British tea and talk about, you know, their right to vote. Many of them, if you read their literature, many of them were racist. There was a lot of anti-black racism in their literature, in their comments. In fact, many of them were motivated to push for the right to vote because it was insulting to them that a black man could vote, but they couldn't vote. So there is a racist element to first wave feminism. That's something that cannot be denied, my dear brothers and sisters. And again, this is something that Islam granted women during the time of the Prophet. So you see in first wave feminism, you see that women essentially want to be participants. But things take a drastic change when we transition to second wave feminism. So we're talking to so 1920s and then there's a bit of a lull. And then we begin with second wave feminism. In 1949, Simone de Beauvoir writes one of the most important books which is considered the Bible of the feminist movement. She wrote The Second Sex, where she essentially argues that femininity is disconnected from biology. You see, in the beginning, women wanted to participate. They were fine with the system. Second wave feminism, there's a shift. Now, we need to tear down the system. We need to tear down the patriarchy. Femininity is disconnected from biology. And what does she say? She writes, and I quote, so there is a move to abolish the traditional institutions. Now you start to hear a lot of anti-marriage, anti-family rhetoric. For instance, she says, woman is a female to the extent that she feels herself as such. She continues and she says, nature does not define woman. Okay, now we're going in a different direction. It is she who defines herself by reclaiming nature for herself. Women start to see their biology as a disadvantage. And therefore, there is now this argument that gender is a social construct. That the only reason women behave the way that they do is because they're conditioned. If you were to ask Simone de Beauvoir, why is it that women seem to like becoming wives and mothers? She would argue that this is indoctrination. And she says, she writes in 1975, listen very carefully to this. So when I say that feminism needs to be critiqued, it's not because I'm anti-women. I'm critiquing this because I see this ideology as very dangerous to women because it doesn't align with Islamic values. I quote, in 1975, Simone de Beauvoir writes, no woman should be authorized to stay at home to raise her children. Allahu Akbar. Society should be totally different. I have a problem with these traditional gender roles. Women should not have that choice precisely because if there is such a choice, too many women will make that one. 
She's arguing that we need to save women from their own tendencies because their tendencies, their inclinations have nothing to do with their fitrah. It has nothing to do with their biology. It's because they've been indoctrinated by patriarchal institutions. This is in Britain. So we go to America around the same time period. Famous, and I'm mentioning to you the most prominent feminist thinkers. Betty Friedan, famous American feminist. In 1963, she wrote The Feminine Mystique. In her book, she writes, she essentially equates motherhood with a comfortable concentration camp. Motherhood is a comfortable concentration camp. I ask you, brothers and sisters, objectively, put all biases aside, if this is the rhetoric from the leading Western feminists, the secular feminists, if this is the rhetoric are they encouraging women to get married and start families? They're not. What happened to what the Prophet said? And nikah sunnati, marriage is my way. These feminists think these many of these feminists they say no 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 no, this is a destructive path. Why would you want to live in a concentration camp? Now again, no one is denying that there are some oppressive husbands. But the fact that there are some oppressive husbands doesn't mean that the solution is so radical that we start saying irresponsible things like motherhood is like a comfortable concentration camp. And by the way, she rescinded that comment later on. But you never hear about it. So what is really liberating for women is to be like men. So... The abortion rights movement. And by the way, some of the leaders of the abortion rights movement, they were men. Who do you think benefits from abortion the most? Men. Because they get to have their fun without any of the responsibility. Unless, it's, of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of rape, right? So a lot of these abortion rights actually give an advantage to men. It allows men to get off of the hook. They get to have their fun. They get to exploit without any accountability, without embracing responsibility. Even if you look at the, the fight for equal employment, employment opportunities, we see this huge wave of women joining the workforce after World War II. Do you think society was doing a favor to women? Do you think that these people came forward and said that, you know what? We believe in equality. We want women to work. The only reason why they were encouraged to work and leave the home is because there was a major gap, a void in the labor force. It was about money all along. You're talking about individuals. Some of them might be sincerely trying to help women, but they're getting it wrong. There are problems, but we, we have to ensure that the solutions are not so extreme that you're dismantling some of the most important human institutions. So the argument here with second feminism is what? That gender roles are inherently stifling. We have to reject these roles to be free. That's second wave feminism. And then you get to third wave feminism, where the real fun begins. Third wave feminism, again, we don't have enough time to go into all of these details, but I'm sharing with you some of the literature, the rhetoric that's coming out of these thinkers. There was a woman by the name of Shulamit Firestone, in the 1970s, she wrote, so this is third wave feminism. The end goal of the feminist revolution. So you might ask, okay, where is this going? Where does the train stop? Where are we going? Initially, it was about 
being a more active participant, fine. Then we went to, we need to dismantle the system. Where are we going now? She writes, the end goal of the feminist revolution must be, unlike that of the first feminist movement, not just to eliminate male privilege, not just the elimination of male privilege, but of sex distinction itself. Do you know what that means? Biology doesn't matter anymore. Advocating for gender fluidity. Biological sex doesn't mean anything anymore. Everything is entirely subjective. Gender is entirely performative. It's all indoctrination. It's all social conditioning. But the funny thing is, when it's war and it's when it's survival, subhanAllah, everybody goes back to their traditional gender roles. And if you don't believe me, examine any period in human history. What happened on the Titanic? How come no one was saying that, no, we need to have an equal number of men on the boats as women? The natural instinct of a man kicks in, as we spoke about last night. Protector, provider. And that's how it should be. And this shows us that Allah put it in our fitrah. That when there is danger, the man is to sacrifice his life to protect the life of a woman. That means the life of a woman actually has more value. Because the life of the man is to be laid down to preserve the life of a woman. But that's not what they're teaching. They're teaching the Aslan there is no such thing as man and women. The Quran says, وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرَ وَكَالْأُنثَى Third wave feminist, there is no such thing as dhakar and there's no such thing as untha. That's a quick overview. Now, we've touched a little bit upon some of the problems. Now, again, there are many different strands of feminism and it must be said, we have to be fair, some of the harshest critics of feminism have been other feminists. Sometimes, you know, we have to give credit where credit is due. Feminism, especially in the colonial period, Western feminists often used feminism, they weaponized feminism to justify their colonial projects. Why do you want to invade these Muslim territories? We don't want to rescue the women. The poor, oppressed Muslim woman. We want to save her. These ideologies were used to invade the countries of your brothers and sisters. So let's not pretend that this is just about women's rights. It's much more complicated than that. It's an ideologically loaded word with a lot of very serious historical baggage. So some of, the, some of the dominant rhetoric, some of the common rhetoric, you see is that women today, especially in feminist circles, and again, we're speaking about secular feminism, they're often taught that a woman should strive to achieve complete independence from a man. That's the best way to plan your life. In fact, at the height of the feminist movement in the 1960s, Gloria Steinem, she made a joke, but with every joke, there is a half-truth. She says, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Obviously, fish don't need bicycles. Some of the brothers are confused. Fish don't need bicycles. She's arguing that women, they don't need men. We don't need men. They're worthless. And again, as I said last night, part of it is our fault, my brothers. 
I think that if we actually lived up to our Islamic values, our women, our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our daughters, they would not seek refuge in these ideologies. They gravitate towards these ideas because it gives them a language through which they can communicate and articulate their grievances. Because many of us failed them. They had to pick up a lot of the slack. Many of them had to take on the role of men because the men in their lives failed them. We, let's be honest. Let's address the elephant in the room. It's not just, you know, you women are being corrupted by these philosophies. We're part of the problem. That's why I began with the discussion on masculinity. We're part of the problem and we have to be part of the solution. Now from an Islamic perspective, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want men to be fully independent of women and He doesn't want women to be fully independent of men. We need each other. We were created that way. As much as you will try to build your life and plan it in a way where, you know, I don't need a man in my life or I don't need a woman in my life, it's in your fitrah. We need each other. One of the problems with many of these strands of feminism is that one of its main objectives is what? The dismantling of patriarchy. Any structure where there is male authority is inherently oppressive and disadvantageous to women. That's a very problematic position. Why? Number one, if you are looking at the world through the lens of equality and equal representation, you know, these are some of the goals, you're probably going to have a problem with the fact that 124,000 prophets were men. What do you, what do you, so Allah is, Allah is sexist? Allah is upholding patriarchy? Are we going to go in that direction? And if you think it hasn't already happened, you've been living under a rock. Some Muslim feminists have taken it so far, not all of them, but we're, we're starting to see some of this rhetoric. Ha issues with masculine pronouns in the Quran. Qul huwa Allahu ahad makes me feel excluded. Because huwa patriarchy. My God is a she. قُلْ هِيَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ نَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ I didn't give this lecture tonight because I want to tick people off. In fact, I didn't want to give this lecture. But I'm giving it because there is an elephant in the room and this is becoming a path to kufr. Yes, there are some Muslims that are using this. Let us reimagine the Quran. So if we're all if we're gonna dismantle patriarchy, because what is the definition of patriarchy? You see, the problem is some people take one gender studies course and they think they know more than 13 centuries of Islamic scholarship. All of that is gonna be underturned, overturned. Because you took a gender studies course? Where's the humility? What's the definition of patriarchy? There are many definitions. One of them is a system of society or government in which the father or eldest male is the head of the family. Many feminists have an issue with male authority. Okay, there's going to be a conflict here. How are you going to resolve this conflict? In our fiqh, the fiqh of Ja'far al-Sadiq, Muhammad al-Baqir, Imam al-Kazim, Imam... The fiqh of Ahlul Bayt states that what? If a virgin girl wants to get married, she needs the permission of her wali, who happens to be a male. Is that a problem? Do we need to dismantle that? Do we need to change the laws of Islam? Rethink what Ja'far al-Sadiq is saying so we reinterpret in, in a way that confirms with secular feminists? Is that what we've come to? That we have such an inferiority complex that 
secularism, humanism, liberalism is the standard of truth and Ja'far al-Sadiq has to bend to it? Where are we going, brothers and sisters? Where are we going? Imam al-Baqir he says, go to the east, go to the west, you will not find true knowledge except with Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. There's a request to, to move forward. We need some more fortifications from the sister side. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Obviously, I'm joking, sisters. Obviously, I'm joking. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. There was a study conducted by Cornell University in 2019 that states that what matters most to women, even to those who are economically independent, is knowing that they have a man whom they can rely upon. It's in our fitrah. Men need women, women need men. The idea that gender is a social construct, we've already touched upon this. That there are no real differences between men and women, it's all social conditioning. I don't have time to go into all of the literature, but there are significant sexual differences between men and women. There was a study done that looked at the differences in sex drive between men and women. There's a huge disparity, huge disparity. And this is why in the Islamic tradition, that is the one thing that Allah gives to the man as a right. Not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favors men. It's because Allah wants stable families. It's about the family. It's not about the man. It's about what's best for the stability of the family. There are significant hormonal differences. You know, it's sad that we've reached a point that we have to state basic science. There are significant hormonal differences between men and women. David Handelsum, a reproductive endocrinologist, he states that a woman has one-tenth or one-twentieth of the testosterone that a man has. You don't think that's going to make a difference? Of course that's going to make a difference. Men, of course there are exceptions to every rule, but generally speaking, Men are physically stronger, they're faster, they have more endurance. That's why we separate them in competitive sports. Is that, that's not social conditioning, that's science. If you bring the best women's basketball player in history and you put her on the court with LeBron James, what do you think is going to happen? Let's be honest. Different. There are significant physical differences. And the beauty of Islam is that Islam takes all of these differences into consideration. Because that is justice. That is justice. That is equity. There are even cognitive differences. And this is when people get really fussy. They get really riled up about this. Cognitive differences. Yes, there are cognitive differences between men and women. It doesn't mean that one is better. We're different. We complement each other. There was a study done, because again, today, if you say Ali ibn Abi Talib said, no, we have to reinterpret it. But if a person wearing a white lab coat says it, we accept it. A study done looking at sex, di uh, sex differences in cogn cognitive ability. An American psychologist, Diane Halpern, she, she mentions that there are sizable differences in cognitive ability between men and women. There was a study in India in 2014 that compared cognitive functions between male and female medical students. They say that when, when a woman is not in her menstrual cycle, their cognitive ability is the same. And then they say, these are not my words, people want to get offended, they're going to get offended, this is science. They say, however, at the conclusion, 
However, males outperformed females in attention state during the post-ovulatory phases of their menstrual cycles. There is a difference. This is why in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieves a woman of the duty of salah when she is on her cycle. This is rahmah. This is a mercy. There, we have a creator who legislates based on real differences, who's not going to pretend that men and women are the same. There are differences. The problem, my dear brothers and sisters, is that what happens is that oftentimes women find themselves in societies, maybe they've been in relationships that have traumatized them, and they feel that the only way to secure their safety is to focus on their education, to delay marriage, and just make your career the focal point. That marriage is something that can be delayed. But the reality, my dear brothers and sisters, is that abusive men existed during the time of the Prophet. What was the Prophet's solution to the problem? Did the Prophet ever say to any women, did Imam Ali ever say to any women that, you know what? The men can't be relied upon. Abusive men. Delay marriage. Focus on being an entrepreneur and you can delay marriage. The Prophet never said that. In fact, we have a hadith from the Prophet Muhammad Wali Muhammad. The hadith from the Prophet says, from one of the Imams, Naha Rasulullah and Nisa Ayyatabatalna wa yu'atilna and fusuhunna min al azwaj. The Prophet forbade women from delaying marriage, from choosing not to get married. Now the question here is, are you more protective of women than the Prophet? Khadija inherited wealth from her father. She built a business. And of course people, they stop there. What did she do after she got married? She prioritized her family. See, that's the part of Khadija's life that is omitted. She prioritized her family. Because there is a biological reality that cannot be denied. Men and women should get married early. They shouldn't delay marriage. But if a man delays marriage, it is not as risky as it is if a woman delays marriage. This is very clear in our literature. Why? Because women have a strong maternal impulse. You might not want it now, but I promise you, career is not going to be the most satisfying thing in life. You're going to prioritize your education. You're going to delay marriage. And you know, the, the funny thing is that non-Muslims, they have boyfriend and girlfriend, and they're just fine. Why is it that if I recite a sigha, my life is going to end? And what are you doing with these natural desires? How are you delaying marriage so long without inevitably falling into haram? How? You know, my dear brothers and sisters, there's so much to cover, but I want to share with you a comment. Actually, I'll share a hadith, and then I'll, I'll go to Betty Friedan's, uh, the recent, uh, you know, her omission or the correction of a statement that she made. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. There's a very beautiful hadith where Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatima to Zahra, they came to the Prophet. They came to the Prophet and they asked the Prophet a question about gender roles within the context of family. Ali wa Fatima ila Rasulillahi fil khidma. 
فقضى على فاطمة بخدمتها ما دون الباب. The Prophet, his judgment was that, O oh, Fatima, your domain is from the door and inside of the house. Meaning that the home is your main domain. وَقَضَى عَلَىٰ عَلِيٍ بِمَا خَلْفَ And he said to Ali, your job is outside of the house. What was the reaction of Fatima to Zahra? Because I could tell you this hadith is obviously not going to be very popular today. I already know that. I'm mentioning it knowing that. And I, I think that it's very dangerous to create a culture of intimidation and censoring because some people don't like certain ahadith because they don't align with liberal or secular values. If we don't talk about these issues, the teachings of Ahlul Bayt will be lost. We have to know. If you, if you don't want to live up to the ideal, that's up to you. But we need to know what the ideal is. And you know, people will argue today that, Shaykh, we need two incomes to live. We both have to work. And I understand that. I live in the most expensive city in the world, Vancouver. Don't move there. You can't afford housing. I understand that. But I think that we have to make a critical decision. I think, my dear brothers and sisters, we have to think deeply and we have to start planning our lives in a way where we can live on one income. And I know it's going to take sacrifice. You can't drive the Teslas maybe. You have to live in a smaller house. You have to make sacrifices. You're not, you might not be able to go on those fancy vacations. It's going to require sacrifice. But I'll tell you this, it's a lot better than working full time, mother and father are not available, and your kids are sent to daycares, and you hand over the tarbiyah of your kids to the state. Because if that happens, not only are they going to lose their religion, they're going to lose their gender. And you know what I'm talking about. So when the Prophet says, Fatima, this is your domain, and Ali, this is your domain, what was her reaction? Ya Rasulullah, there should be equality. What was her reaction? Faqalat Fatima. La basallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Fala ya'lamu ma da khalani min as-surur. Only Allah, Fatima says, only Allah knows the happiness that I felt in my heart. بِإِكْفَاءِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ تَحَمُّلْ رِقَابَ الرِّجَالِ I thank Allah that He has relieved me of the burden that He placed on the necks of men. She was happy. You see, the problem with secular feminism is that it tells women that they could do it all. You could do it all. You could be a mother, a wife, a businesswoman. But I tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, you can't do it all. It's too much. We're human beings. And it's criminal. Do you know how many sisters say that I, I want to get married? I want to be a housewife. I want to be a stay-at-home mother. But society has conditioned them to think that they're a failure if they take that path. And that's criminal. Because there is a silent majority that exists of women who want to be women. They want to live in accordance with their fitrah. But they're told what? That no, you have to go against your fitrah. You have to live your life and you have to mimic men because that's the pathway to happiness, right? That's what they were told. That's what we were all told. That's what I thought when I was growing up. Do you remember Betty Friedan? After she wrote her book, The Feminine Mystique, where she says that being a mother, motherhood is like a comfortable concentration camp. You know, she, she wrote a book after that, about a decade after, called The Second Stage. You don't hear about what she says in that book because it's an inconvenient truth to the secularist narrative. What does she write? She says, she starts to survey and study women. Okay, now women... 
they're working, they have more financial resources, their lives are a lot more similar to men. So surely they must be happier. She says, and I quote, this is something that she wrote in 1970. She says, women, experience, are, women are experiencing, women experiencing more signs of psychological stress than women in their 20s and 30s had in the 1950s and early 1960s and were more likely to feel on the edge of a nervous breakdown than young men. She says women in their, between 35 and 39, one third of them in the 1970s experienced a nervous breakdown. And she says women have a profound human impulse to have children. Oh, really? You spent the greater portion of your life telling women that it's a comfortable concentration camp. And now you want to rescind? And she even realizes that her and her colleagues, they created a monster. She writes, We had better find a change. But change is hard. Because women have almost a religious feeling about the women's movement. A sacredness, a reverence, an awe. And she says, it keeps us from asking questions about what, women re what, what really matters to women. And I'll conclude with this. Germaine Greer, an Australian feminist who identifies as a radical feminist, in a radio interview, she says, again, same rhetoric, Delaying marriage, prioritizing career, you don't need a man in your life, men are dispensable. It was, she says, I was desperate for a baby, and I have the medical bills to prove it. She says, I still have pregnancy dreams, waiting with vast joy, something that will never happen. She's mourning her unborn children because she believed the lie that for a woman to be happy, she should mimic the lifestyle of a man. But in our tradition, my dear brothers and sisters, what makes a woman unique is her femininity. What makes a man unique is his masculinity. What makes marriage so beautiful is that you have two different beings who come together and who complete each other who have different natures. This is, this is what Islam teaches. And my humble request, my dear brothers and sisters, to think deeply about the things that we've taken for granted. And inshallah, we'll be able to explore these discussions in more depth. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. One of the most beautiful things about the story of Karbala is that the men and the women, they participated in a revolution, but the women never went against their fitrah, and the men never went against their fitrah. It's a beautiful revolution. Masculine men, men being true to their nature, women being true to their nature. Imam al Hussein salam, never asked the women to fight because that's not what they're built for. He asked Zainab to look after the children, the women, because women are better at helping people in trauma. Everybody has their strength. When Imam al Hussein السلام, was in Mecca, the Imam was receiving letters from the people of Kufa. The Imam السلام, on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, he departs Mecca. He departs Mecca a day before. Arafah, 
a day before the climax of Hajj, Yawm Tarwiyah, he leaves. And it's as though Imam al Hussein was saying, what value does Hajj have if you've abandoned the values and the spirit of Islam? Many of us today are very similar in the sense that we are more religious in terms of performing rituals. But we're far away from Islamic values. We have secular values, but we pray. We have liberal values, but we fast. We have feminist values, but we go to Hajj. What Imam al Hussein salam, wants from us is to have Islamic values. To, to have an Islamic worldview, a worldview that is rooted in the Quran, in the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt. So the Imam, he leaves. He travels for 23 days. He, he stops at 30 resting stations. Through the valleys, through the deserts, when the Imam السلام, reaches the outskirts of Kufa, the Imam السلام, is intercepted by a brigade of a thousand soldiers. Ibn Ziyad had commanded one of his most decorated commanders, one of his most decorated military commanders, to intercept Imam al Hussein and prevent him from entering Kufa. He was following instructions. When Imam al Hussein arrived, he was intercepted. Hur, even though he blocked the Imam's entrance, he was still respectful in the way that he spoke to Imam al Hussein. And sometimes I wonder, maybe it's because of the respect he showed Imam al Hussein that Allah gave him the tawfiq of hidayah. He respected Imam al Hussein so much that when it was the time of salah, Imam al Hussein asked Hur that, Would you like to join our jama'ah or do you want to lead your soldiers in prayer? Hur said, Ya Aba Abdullah. I would be honored to pray behind you. And he says to the Imam that, Oh Imam, I'm only following orders. I don't want to fight you. I don't want to trouble you. But I cannot allow you to enter Kufa. So Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he looks at his companions and he says, Does anyone know a place that we can go and set camp? There was a man by the name of at tarimah who was a camel driver. He was familiar with the territory. He said to the Imam, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I can take you to a patch of land that's not too far away. It's off of the main road. And I think that it would be a suitable place for you to set camp. Imam al Hussein says, okay. He brings at tarimah and he says, I want you to guide this camel. And be very gentle when you guide this camel because Sayyid Zainab is on this camel. Be very gentle. This is the daughter of Amir al Mu'mineen. This is the, the light of the Hashimiyat. At Tarimah, he holds the reins. And as he's walking, he recites poetry in support of Imam al Hussein. He holds the reins and he says, Ya naqati la tajza'i min zajri Ya naqati la tajza'i min zajri وشمري وشمري قبل طلوع الفجر بخير ركبان وخير سفري 
آل رسول الله آل الفخر السادة البيض الوجوه الزهري السادة البيض الوجوه الزهري يا مالك النفع معا والضر أيد حسينا سيدي بالنصر He takes Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam the caravan travels until they arrive on a patch of land Imam Al-Hussein is on his horse suddenly the horse of Imam Al-Hussein stops Abi Abdullah al Hussein, he thinks to himself that maybe the horse is tired. Maybe the horse is fatigued. He changes his horse. And again, the horse does not move. Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, he says, Ashabi, oh my companions, Masmu hadihi al ard. What is the name of this land? They say to him, Ya ibn Rasulillah, innaha al-Ghadriyat. It's the land of al-Ghadriyat. Imam al Hussein says, does it have another name? They say, Ya ibn Rasulillah, innaha al-Shatt al-Furat. This is the bank of the Euphrates. It's called the bank of the Euphrates. The Imam says, no. Is there another name for this land? They said, Ya ibn Rasulillah, innaha naynawa. This is the land of naynawa. The Imam says, no, there's, I'm looking for another name. Does it have another name? At that moment, there was a Bedouin traveling through the deserts. They asked him, Does, what is the name of this land? This is the land of Karbala. Allahu Akbar. When Imam al Hussein, when he heard the name Karbala, Abi Abdullah, he raised his hands in dua and said, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al Karbi wal Bala. Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from affliction and calamity. The Imam alayhi salam, he turns to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, Ali al-Akbar. He says to them, we've reached our destination. قَالَهَا هُنَا مَحَطُّ رِحَالِنَا This is where we will encamp. This is where we will set our camps. And then what does he say to them? These are not ordinary people. They know what they've gotten themselves involved in. This is where our men will be killed. This is the sand that will absorb the blood of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. What else, Ya Aba Abdullah? What's going to happen in this land? This is where our children will be slaughtered. Aba Abdullah, what else is going to happen in this land? This is where our tents will be burned. How many fires has this family endured? What else, Aba Abdullah? What is going to happen? Probably the most painful of all things. This is where our women will be taken as captives. This is where the sister of Abel Fadl al Abbas will be taken as a captive. 
لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين صلوا على محمد وآل محمد